On my diagnosis, like many people, it took eight years. I started with lower quadrant pain in and out of the hospital, dealing with internist and gastroenterologist. We did surgery for this massive blockage and uh, he talked to Howard first. He came into my room and sat down and he said, oh, he says, we have to wait for pathology, but I really think it's carcinoid. And I said, it's malignant, isn't it? Yes, and do you know an uh, oncologist? And I said, no, and he said well, he'd send one in. He came in expecting to see a little old middle-aged woman all depressed and said, I said, now I have a name of what's wrong with me. When I get out of here, I'm going to start fighting it. When she first was diagnosed, I was in the waiting room, uh, and the doctor came to me and said that, that she had carcinoid. So I was uh, crying. Because <laughs> I figured she'd be dead in a few months. And then we got the results that it was carcinoid, and that doctor on Long Island had said, well, you'll have a very short life. There's really nothing we can do. I got a call from my physician friend who said, good news, you have a neuroendocrine tumor. I'm sure they can remove it. And that started my next odyssey in learning that most doctors who, um, who will see you until you see a specialist know nothing about neuroendocrine tumors. My friend said, no, don't believe that you'll only have a short life. There has to be something that we could do. And I thought, well, I guess I just have to accept it. What can I do? And my friend said, no, there has to be something. We'll have to research this. We'll look on the computer. We'll make phone calls. When I compare carcinoid to many, many other cancers, uh, I feel very, very fortunate because um, I don't feel that I will die from this disease. I feel that I will die with it. Um, obviously, it was scary. Obviously, you hear the C word and you get scared a little bit and th friends and family were scared of it. I'm 26 years old. I'm a nurse, but I'd never heard of that kind of tumor, so I kind of was wigging out a little bit. I, I didn't know what it meant, what we were facing ahead of us, didn't have a clue, so it was a little bit scary. It, it can be a chronic disease and that's something that um, sometimes you have to accept. Um, but the, people can learn to live with this disease and, um, and, and live well with it. Most cancers, or a lot of cancers, you go to war with. This one you play chess with. Cancer has such a negative connotation to it, and what you first have to realize is that this is more of a chronic disease. You can, you can live, you can live a long life. You see, I'm here, it's, it's almost 11 years. When you tell someone you have cancer or you, this is what you're going through, pretty much after the word cancer, or I have something you know that's really important to tell you, um, somewhere 30 seconds along the line, the, their brain will go into freeze mode. Online support groups, I think, are very important for uh, patients with rare diseases. We learn from each other, and I think that um, to hear that somebody else has gone through the same things that you've gone through, and that they're having the same kinds of problems that you're having um, in trying to get medical care, that's kind of like very good emotional support that helps to keep a person strong to be able to, um, I guess, have the determination to go out and do what they need to do to try to get more appropriate care. I remember my first meeting, I was so nervous. And I um, was also a little reluctant to go because just the word support group sounds like a pity party and I really didn't really want to sit around and just wallow in this. I really wanted education. I learned about, I won't say fighting, but learning about being aggressive with your disease and learning about learning more. We chose to use the word network because that really sort of encompasses everything. It's, um, it's not just offering support for you know, the patients and the caregivers, but it's also providing information so that patients can go back to their doctors with um, information and help uh, educate uh, their physicians and their medical staff as well. It's almost like um, having like a second family, um, but a family of uh, carcinoid patients or neuroendocrine tumor patients actually.
luckily my wife is a nurse, so she helped me, obviously supported me through this whole thing. Um, and, and at least knew, hey, where to research and kind of ask questions and things of that nature. And so we, we came across the, uh, the carcinoid website as, as they figured out that it was a carcinoid tumor. I'm not sure I'm that much of a caregiver. I, Susan is, is the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm just there to totally support her. There's a lot of hope for patients with neuroendocrine. There are a lot of really brilliant people who are working on research that we don't see when we're on the net, when things that aren't published, that they're working very hard to bring new treatments, new diagnostics um, to us. I do go, I continue to go to work. I do many things and sometimes I do need to rest and I notice that I sleep a lot more and sometimes I become very fatigued, but it's up and down, good days and bad days. I go with the flow. One of the things I said was, you know, one of, you're gonna remove a lung, what can I do with one lung? And they said, well, you can do you know, normal active life other than run a marathon. So that was one of the things that obviously inspired me to, to run a marathon. And um, a year and a month, I ran a marathon after, after the surgery. People say I'm an example of living with carcinoid because uh, I already did two book clubs. We do jam sessions on our home every week. Did every week for 31 years music. Obviously living a better life with my two children and my wife um, and family and uh, just trying to be the best person I can for them. And obviously the running piece of that definitely helps that, trying to stay healthy. So It was a little bit scary, but I didn't have children involved at, at that time. So it was scary to think, oh my gosh, we may never have children. Um, but as a mom now, I'm still scared, you know, every year when he goes for his scans that, you know, it, it would reoccur. And so that's why I kind of try to stay up with the follow up every year and make sure we're doing what we need to do to, you know, catch anything early if it were to come back. Because um, it's a scary thing to think about. <laughs> the idea of taking charge of your own medical treatment was kind of a surprise, I think, because that was something only the doctors did in the past. Uh, you just went there and they told you what you were going to do and they told you what, what was going to happen. Doctors aren't always right and you have to listen to your own body. I started educating myself by going to conferences. Literally changed my life uh, by coming to a conference. I, as a nurse, know that um, you know, education is key and knowledge is so important in, you know, handling this disease so that you can live a full, happy life. The patient that gets in and learns about their disease does so much better than the one that wants their family to do it or their doctor to do it. And I say that they need to learn about their disease, find a good doctor, do aggressive treatment if that's suitable for them, and then don't obsess over the disease and get on and live life. It inspires me to continue to do what I'm doing because I can tell my story to other folks um, and hopefully inspire them to, um, you know, work through, um, the, you know, their, uh, their cancer, um, to get support from their family and friends. Um, so hopefully that's what I'm doing is hopefully just encouraging them to do something um, about it. But otherwise I say get on and live and give thanks and carry on. It's a good life. <laughs>